isosahedron uh, comes from. The isosahedron in kinematic space. And once again, remember, our kinematic space, our kinematic space is the space of xijs, right? So there are these nn minus 3 over 2 variables. And we're going to ask, a, uh, we're going to now try to ask a question in xij space. Okay, we're going to look for some structure, ask a question in xij space, um, whose answer will be the isosahedron. And not only whose answer will be the isosahedron, but we'll understand why. We're going to ask a question that manifestly is going to give us a polytope, which also manifestly factorizes into polytopes on the same type when we go on its facets. Okay? So again, that's the, that's the nature of the kind of thing that we're trying to do. This is our kinematic space. We're going to try to find a structure in this kinematic space. Now, this is a story uh, that uh, um, uh, I'm going to give you the artisanal version of the story. Uh, artisanal is, uh, as it sounds, you know, by art. Um, so this is something we sort of stumbled across with Song He and Yan Tao Bai and Zhang Wen Wang. We, uh, uh, stumbled across this realization of the Isosahedron back in 2017. And in 2019, we found this sort of uh, more conceptual way of understanding where it comes from, but it still had some kind of element of guessing and art in it. Um, I think now we understand it as a completely canonical conceptual thing with no guessing and no art at all. And uh, again, that's something that um, in one way or another I'll be talking about on Monday. But, um, but that'll be a little too abstract to just get. So I want to tell you this sort of more, somewhat more intuitive way of thinking about things, which already is going to give you an idea for how this kind of thing uh, can uh, come about. OK, so and um, now all of this are things that we see for the isosahedron that actually we saw uh, in many ways even more strikingly with the amplitohedron, which I will still hope to get to. Uh, but, um, but in the story of the amplitude, and ultimately you begin by just looking at the kinematic space, just thinking about the kinema kinematic space, imagining labeling the kinematic space, and then at some important moment you say the word positivity, and then everything goes. Okay? So, so we're going to try to do the same thing here. Um, OK. Now, so to begin with, uh, let's just represent the, our variables in an intelligent way. Like, I could represent them just by giving a big list, x13, x14, let's say n equals 5, x24, x25, x35. Okay, these are my five variables. But I want to just graphically denote the variables, okay? And notice that uh, I have, you know, I have an n gone here. So there's a natural sort of cyclic symmetry to the problem. Right? Again, there's one, two, three. The, the, the indices are ordered going, going around. So what I'm going to do is just write these x's just, just to denote them just by points on a grid in the obvious way. Okay? So you know, you'd have 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 2, 3, just, just the obvious 90-degree uh, grid. Um, except I'm going to, uh, for reasons that will become clear in a second, I'm just going to orient uh, everything by 45 degrees. So I would start with, like, let's say x12 here, okay? And then when I go in this direction, I'm going to increase the rightmost index by 1. So this will go up to x13. That'll go up to x14. That'll go up to x15. Okay. And in this direction, I increase the other index. Okay. So this would be uh, x23, and then x24, which that makes sense there, and x25. Okay. 
And here, n equals 5, right? And OK, so I could keep on going in this direction. So who would this be? This would be x53, right? This would be x54. This would be, uh, oh, sorry, that's it there. So see, what, what, why did I, uh, yeah. Um, OK, so here I'd have x34. And now, so why, uh, why am I uh, uh, stopping here? And this also explains why I drew it uh, uh, by rotating 45 degrees, just for convenience. Because you see, x12 is actually not a variable, right? x12 is one of the edges of the polygon, and that's the thing which is on shell. So x12 is 0. x23 is 0. x34 is 0. Similarly here, x15 is 0 x54 is 0, and so on, right? But I have this grid that goes off to infinity in both directions, OK? Just cyclically re repeating, OK? So far, so good, right? Nothing, nothing exciting is, uh, is, is happening yet. There is a little peculiarity in this uh, picture. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let, me, let me maybe draw. Oops, ah, shoot, I shouldn't have used that. Uh, I'm going to draw. Uh, um, so imagine in, in your mind that, uh, that I can populate this with any number of these. I'm going to make a grid like this anyway, right? OK, um, uh, so I'm going to just label this direction just, just a name for this direction I'm going to call t and this direction x. So something that looks like time and space, all right? Uh, just, just, names, uh, just names for the moment. You'll see why. Um, but. Uh, so I'm just going to draw a continuum picture for the minute. Just in your mind, imagine filling it with as many uh, with lines, 45 degree lines, uh, however you like. Um, I just want to say some, some basic things. So one thing is that um, there is a periodicity by two in this uh, setup. So there's something a little interesting here. You see here we have 5, 3, right? And uh, actually, I didn't draw it up here. And here is 3, 5 is up there. Okay, so 5, 3 is down here, but 3, 5 is, uh, uh, is, uh, is up there. Okay? So, but of course, x5, 3 is the same as x3, 5. So this guy here is identified with this guy there. And so in general, in this picture, if I have a point here, which is at x, and t, and I imagine you know, this as sort of length 1, then it's identified here with a point that's 1 minus x and 1 plus t. Okay? In other words, this is ij, and this is ji. All right, so that's just a little thing to uh, notice. Okay, so it has, a, it has a Mobius property. So there's this Mobius uh, identification. Okay, well, if you don't, if, if, it, or it's just this trivial thing which I said. Okay, so, um, so now let's say I want to uh, just then choose some kind of non-redundant way of labeling the variable. So I just want to choose some chunk out of this grid. I want to choose some chunk out of this grid such that every variable occurs once, either as ij or as ji, right? But if I, I, won't get, I don't want to have 3, 5, and 5, 3 together, OK? And there are many ways of doing it, but any such way of doing it is going to, going to break the symmetry of this problem a little bit. I mean, I have this infinite strip, and I just have to choose some region 
I have to choose some region of the strip that has the property that uh, every variable is contained once and only once. And you can choose any way of doing it that you like, but I'm gonna choose one of them, and what I'm gonna tell you will work for every such way of doing it. <laughs> but I'm just gonna, for simplicity, choose uh, one of them, which is the easiest to uh, work with. And um, so let me draw what it looks like, let's say for n equals seven. So once again, we have these boundary guys are special here. So that's one, two. Okay, so uh, can you see plainly that every variable is uh, there once and only once? So for instance, 2, 5 is here, but 5, 2 would have been up there somewhere. OK? This is kind of amusing, because uh, this is what, of course, the kind of Penrose diagram of Minkowski space for a scattering amplitude looks like. But anyway, that's, uh, <laughs> that's uh... all right. So this is our kinematic space now. OK, we have now represented our kinematic space, right? We've just uh, drawn uh, all the variables in an obvious way. Uh, um, instead of just sprinkling them randomly, I'm organizing them by whether the indices are close to each other, just according to the cyclic rotation around the polygon. All right, but there's a really cool thing here, even going back before making this choice, but I just want to make clear this is our kinematic space. This is our kinematic space. Well, let's go back to this general picture. There's actually a good reason why I called this T and this X, okay? Because there's a very particular sense in which we should think about this as a space-time picture. Completely different space-time. <laughs> has nothing to do with the space-time, the scattering process. But there's a good reason why this T, this direction is sort of usually thought of as time-like. Let's go back and... Uh, Remember, what's the kind of most important thing about these chords? The most important thing is if the chords cross or don't cross, right? So we know that also all the drama is going to be about whether these chords cross or uncross. And when we think about the chords as just a chord on the end gone, of course, we can see whether they cross or not cross. But what we've now done by going to this kinematic space is a point in this kinematic space is one of the chords before. Okay, so now we should ask, what does it mean for the two chords to cross? What property do the two points have on the left-hand side uh, that the chords cross or don't cross on the right-hand side? Okay? And the answer is the following. It's, it's very easy to see. You see, let's say here is IJ and here is KL, somewhere else. Okay? IJ and KL will cross each other if and only if IJ and KL are the past and future corners of a causal diamond that fits inside this space-time. What I mean is, if I draw 45-degree lines back, and I now think of these as light rays, okay? So this is the past of KL. This is the future of IJ. And IJ and KL, as chords, intersect each other if and only if this picture fits inside the strip. Okay? So we can see this very easily in this example, right? 
So let's say I take uh, 2, 5, and 3, 7. So here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So I have 2, 5, and 3, 7. Cross. Okay. Well, here's 2, 5, and 3, 7. And indeed, 2, 5, and 3, 7 are the past and future uh, corners of a causal diamond. But what about 2, 5, and 1, 6? Right? Well, there's 2, 5, and there's 1, 6. And you see 2, 5, and 1, 6 are a space-like separated. <laughs> okay? And you can also have situations, I don't know, let's take uh, um, 2, 4, and 4, 6. Okay? So here's 2, 4, and 4, 6. Also, don't cross each other. Okay? And what happens here is that 4, 6 is there, and there's its past light cone, and here's 2, 4, its future light cone, but you see, they can't meet. There's not enough room for them to meet. Okay, so 2, 4 going forward, that, so, where, where, so the, the, the causal diamond doesn't fit inside this strip. All right? All right, and so that's that's very easy. That's very easy just to check. But this is slightly striking that this just we've organized our variables in such a way that the question of whether or not things are compatible is associated with um, uh, whether or not the points are uh, uh, past and future corners of a light cone. Okay. Now we have our kinematic space. And now we have to ask a question in kinematic space. We have to do something in kinematic space. All right? And now let me tell you what we're going to do. Now, if someone were to just tell you, just you're a physicist, and you have some space, some two-dimensional space with one time and one space coordinate, and you want to write down some equation in this space, for some variable. Oh, oh, and what is our, you know, so we have, we have this x that depends on ij, right? I was writing as xij, right? So it's like I have an x that depends on two variables. What kind of equation would you think of writing down in two dimensions? Yeah. Uh, what's the harmonic oscillator equation in two dimensions? In one dimension, it's x double dot plus omega squared x equals zero. What is it in two dimensions? R double dot. Well, you, you have two kinds of dot, right? You have r double dot and r double prime. And what is that equation called? It's the wave equation, right? All right, so just keep that in mind. In fact, what we're going to do is write down the following uh, uh, equations. For every diamond that you see in the picture, uh, actually, let, let me, for, the, for all these tiny diamonds that we see in the picture, for every diamond that we see, right, um, whatever the diamond is, it has a past, it has a past and a future and a left and a right. We're going to write down the equation x future plus x past minus x left minus x right is equal to a constant. Okay? And that constant will depend on what the, uh, what the uh, diamond is, which diamond we're talking about. OK. Now, what does this equation remind you of? Let's say you make this diamond very, very small. What is this combination? past plus future minus left minus right. It's a double derivative, right? It's d by du. So if this direction is u, this direction is v, it's d by du, d by dv. Okay? So this is something that in the limit where the diamond gets very small is literally the wave equation. What is this equation itself? If you just imagine this was in a continuum, there's no discrete anything. This is Gauss's law for the wave equation. You've maybe never thought of Gauss's law for the wave equation. You think about Gauss's law for the Laplacian, but there's also a Gauss's law for the wave equation, and this is it. <laughs> okay? If you have a one plus one dimensional wave equation, then, um, uh, then uh, so if you have the equation uh, du dv uh, x equals some current c, 
then Gauss's law is exactly that if you take any diamond, past, future, left, right, x past plus x future minus x left minus x right is just the integral of the current inside the diamond. Okay? And you can prove that the same fact. that You, you, you really prove it by showing that, it, that in the limit as the diamonds get small, you get, uh, you get the wave equation back. Notice a, a cool thing. You see, if I tell you this equation for this little diamond and for that little diamond, if I tell you Gauss's law for this diamond and then for that diamond, then if I just add those two Gauss's law, what do I get? I get the equation for that diamond, right? Because I get this plus this minus that minus that plus this plus this minus that minus that, but that guy cancels in the middle. So I'm just left with the boundary pieces, just like, you know, or, the way Stokes' theorem works, except very visually in 2D like this, right? The, okay? So, so in fact, giving you just the, uh, the, the primitive uh, uh, Gauss's laws for these little diamonds uh, guarantees that you have the Gauss's law that's satisfied for all the diamonds, um, where the right-hand side is just the sum of all the meshes. Okay? So if you put meshes together in any way to make a bigger mesh, then the big Gauss's law will be just the sum of all the meshes that are contained in it. Okay, so far so good? Now, here's maybe admittedly a jump. Why did we pull this wave equation out of nowhere, et cetera? Okay, but I'm gonna do it without apology. This is the artisanal part, uh, uh, and, and we, will, we will proceed. But let's see what this looks like in various cases. So for instance, what does it look like when n equals 4? Okay, well here it's really simple, because here I just have 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4. Okay. Here I only have one mesh, which is this one. And so the only equation I'm going to write down is x13 plus x24 equals a constant. Right. Um, from now on, I will label the mesh by its past anchor. Okay. So in this case, I'll label it by C13. That unambiguously says who it is. It's just a mesh that's sort of above that. Okay. All right. So this is our kinematic space, and this is our a question in kinematic space. We're looking at this sort of discrete wave equation in kinematic space. And now uh, we're going to say the word positivity. We're going to ask that all of the xijs are positive, and all of these meshes are positive as well. All these mesh constants for the Gauss's law are positive as well. All right, so let's see what, what happens in this case, right? So I'm trying to solve the equation x13 plus x24 equals c. c is positive, and I also want x13 and x24 to be positive. Now, uh, by the way, since we know this is just a discrete version of the uh, wave equation, we also know that if you give me the initial data on this like past surface, then I can unambiguously solve for every one in the future, right? So that's why it's natural to think of this as initial, the initial surface, the initial Cauchy surface, and I'm going to solve for every one in the future. Is that clear? I can solve for everyone just because, for example, I solve for that guy using this mesh relation, right? Then I use solve for that guy using this one, that one, then I just keep on going, right? So obviously I can solve for everyone if you just give me the initial data, okay? Yes? Sorry? Ah, thank you, thank you. Uh, because, sorry, because remember, x23 is equal to uh, m squared is equal to 0. And x14 is equal to 0. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Okay, so remember, all of these guys at the boundaries, the boundaries are special. 
these boundary things are zero. Okay? Yes? Yes. Yes. And with both of them, uh, I associate some linear function. Yes. And then uh, when I take both of them, the boundary becomes zero. Okay? Yes. So uh, does this fix the equation to any extent if I demand this boundary? Or Basically, yeah. I mean, it, that's right. Yes, it does. Yes. No, 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 no. You need, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, right. Uh, no, it, 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 it fixes it to this form. It has to look like a derivative, in, a discrete derivative in both directions, and it fixes it to this form. So if you wanted to start from that as a primitive thing, then, then that, that might give you a, a motivation for it. Okay. So, but now what I'm going to, now what I want to do is just look at what is, what's the, so uh, let me say again what, what we're doing. Um, so, if we ask for all of the x's to be positive when the c's are positive, that's going to put some constraints on this initial set of x's, right? If they're random, first of all, they all have to be positive to begin with, but they presumably have to satisfy some constraints in order for everyone inside to stay positive, uh, right? So we're going to carve out in the initial, in the space of the initial x's, there's going to be some region which is carved out by this demand. That on the support of this wave equation, of this discrete wave equation, that all the x's remain positive. Let's see what that region looks like. Now, in this, in this example, it's really, it's really simple. Um, so in x13 space, Here's x13 space. So first of all, x13 itself has got to be positive. Okay, so here's the origin in x13 space. So x13 has got to be over here. But also x24 has got to be positive. And x24 is c13 minus x13. So that means that c x13 is got to be less than something. It's got to be less than c13. Okay, so in x13 space, if I imagine these c's are fixed, these c's are some fixed things, in x13 space, I have to live inside this interval. Okay, not very exciting so far, perhaps. All right, let's do the next example. I'll erase this picture. I know I should be moving the boards up and down, but. So now I have one three and one four. This is two four, two five, and three five. Okay, and so now my free variables are x one three and x one four. Right? So now let's write down, uh, uh, but let's write down our, our mesh, mesh equation. So I have x13 plus x24 minus x14 is equal to, uh, is equal to c13. I have this equation, that x25 plus x14 minus x24 equals c24, and I have this equation, which is x24 plus x35 minus x25 equals c, uh, sorry, I did this wrong, that's 1, 4, that's 2, 4. And once again, there's terms that are missing here that are just equal to 0, so I just didn't write them down. Okay, yes? Well, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that, that's the whole interesting thing, is that we're going to see that just by asking, uh, for that, that's one way of motivating these, because you see exactly the, the guys that, that appear here are the ones that are the past and future corners of the tiniest causal diamonds that we could have, right? So 
Um, well, well, we'll come to that in exactly a second, because that's exactly what's going to enforce the, the begin to enforce the structure that we, uh, that we want. So just hang on to your question for, for a sec. Okay. But I just want to say the first, the most mechanical thing that you could do, the most mechanical thing you could do is now you can just solve for 2, 4, 2, 5, and 3, 5 in terms of 1, 3, and 1, 4 from these equations. Okay? So let's, let's do that. Um, uh, in fact, uh, we could take linear combinations of these equations or, um, which is the same thing, we could just look at the picture and draw the mesh that's more convenient for us. So for instance, if I want to solve for x24, well, x24 is already fine. So x24 is equal to uh, c13 plus x14 minus x13 x25, now I could take linear combinations of the equation, but I could go back to the picture. You see, there's a Gauss's law, which is 1, 3, plus 2, 5, minus 0, minus 0, is equal to C1, 3, plus C1, 4. Okay? So I can use that to solve for x25, and x25 is C1, 3, plus C1, 4, minus x1, 3, and x3, 5 is... So who is this guy's convenient Gauss's law? It's with 1, 4. So x1, 4 plus x3, 5 minus 0 minus 0 is c1, 4 plus c2, 4. OK? And so now I want to have that all the x's are positive. So now, if I work in my initial conditions plane, x13 and x14, then clearly they both have to be positive, so I have to live in this upper quadrant. But also, I have to have that, uh, x1, that x14 minus x13 is greater than minus c13, right? So that's a line that starts at minus c13 here and then hits c13 there. So I have to be above here. Okay. And also, you see that x25 being bigger than 0 means that x13 has got to be smaller than something. Now, notice here how crucial it is that my assumption that the c's are positive. Okay. I assume the c's are positive. <clears throat> So the x25 is, uh, means, being positive means that <clears throat> x13 is less than c13 plus c14, but that's bigger than c13. Okay, so that means that I get to go up this way for a while, and then I have a cut here, where I have to be on this side. Okay? And similarly, there's uh, <clears throat> the fact that there's a, C1, uh, the, the, there's a c14 plus sitting there means that x35 bigger than 0 chops this off down here somewhere. Okay. So you see that I have to live inside this pentagon. OK, so what we've seen in our two examples is that if I just ask for uh, this, a solution of the wave equation, a positive solution of the wave equation with positive source that that carves out of the initial condition space, it carves out a shape. And the shape was the interval for n equals 4 and the inside of a pentagon for n equals 5. These are the uh, associohedra so far. Yes? Uh, I'm not explaining it at all. I'll, I'll give some intuition for it in a second. We'll, we'll have some intuition uh, for it in a moment, okay? Uh, but, uh, but I'm just beginning by giving you the answer, okay? And then we'll sort of interpret where this, uh, where this comes from. Um, well, but I'll say it now, that, uh, that we, want to, we want some kind of space where the boundaries correspond to the poles, right? So we know that I can set any one of these x's to zero that I want, and that's supposed to be a pole. So we, want, so we want to have some kind of boundary when any x uh, goes to 0, any x i j goes, goes to 0. So that's why, to begin with, I just impose that they're all positive. Okay, so that's why we should expect some kind of positivity, because we want the sort of boundary, uh, the, 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 the poles to correspond to hitting those boundaries. 
But we need much more to tell that there's some pattern in which how, how they come together, right? Not just that they're individually positive, but there's some pattern in which how they come together. And the, 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 the interesting thing is that the pattern in which in how they come together is captured by this sort of a, a picture of some kind of local uh, process, some, some, uh, some, uh, some local evolution dynamics, all in quotation marks, in this kinematic space. Okay? And now, now we'll understand why. We'll understand why uh, this does everything it should do. Here we've just observed we get the correct shapes, but I'm now go going to explain why we get the correct shapes. Yes? Was there a question up there? You could, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the positive is a pure convention. Uh, in fact, you could have any number you wanted for each boundary separately. And that would correspond to a theory with every propagator is even allowed to have its own mass. Okay? But you could definitely let them all be the same common number. Even So zero here is pure, pure convenience, so I don't have to drag around extra constants. You could, in your mind, put any constant there that you want for each one of them. Okay? Yes? Yes, it's always a pentagon, yes. And, and it's obvious why you get a pentagon, because if you solve in terms of other variables, the, the other variables will just be a linear transformation of these ones. So if you take a linear transformation on this picture, you'll just get another picture with the sides, you know, moved around a little bit, but you'll get, the, you'll get a similar picture. The fact that it's a pentagon is an invariant statement that's independent of the, the sort of coordinates of how I presented it. Okay, all right, so... Um, now, uh, now, why does this work in uh, general? So it's clear that this picture is defining a polytope. Totally clear that it's defining a, a, a general N. Um, so why does this work in general? So clearly for general N, uh, we're always getting a polytope. We get a, we get a polytope. Basically, by construction, right? I have a bunch of linear equations. Uh, I'm asking everyone to be, to be positive on these linear, linear equations. One way of thinking about what we're doing is that we have this very big space of all of the x's, <clears throat> right? And then the, this wave equation is, is, uh, is slicing this space with a hyperplane. Right? There's this big hyperplane that's defined by all these equations uh, associated with every mesh. So the big kinematic space is n, n minus 3 over 2 dimensional, but I, there's a hyperplane in that space, and in this n n minus, in, in this n n minus 3 over, uh, over 2 dimensional space, I just have the positive orthant. Everyone is positive. Very boring. But I take that space and I intersect it with an interesting hyperplane. <laughs> that's given by these mesh relations. Okay, so, for example, in the simplest case of n equals 4, I would have x13 and x14 both positive, but I'm intersecting it with this line x13 plus x24 equals c13. Okay, and if I intersect it, I get that on the on the intersection plane, which in this case is a line, I get this, uh, uh, I get the interval. Or in the n equals five case, I have a five dimensional space, a five dimensional positive orthant, and I'm intersecting it, I'm just slicing it with a three dimensional, with a two dimensional plane. It's three equations that get me down to a two dimensional plane. And on that two dimensional plane, there is this pentagon living there on the two dimensional plane. Who is this two dimensional plane? It's a solution to the wave equation. <laughs> Right, that's, uh, that's what the, the, uh, I have the kinematic space on the support of the solution of the discrete wave equation um, with these, uh, uh, that when I intersect with the positive orthant gives me the, uh, gives me this, uh, uh, gives me the association. Yes? Yes. This is very much a facet definition, yes. Uh, uh, yes, and, uh, and in fact, in a sense, um, uh, um, uh, 
totally understanding a geometry is really that you understand both its vertices and its facets. Okay? Um, but that, uh, that would take me longer than the 15 extra minutes that, that I want to spend on this before I start talking about the uh, empathy. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, but the, the short answer is yes. Okay, that, 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 that. Uh, and that's really ju just the, a broad point. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of things you can say about polytopes the, the, uh, or general positive geometries or polytopes, they have canonical forms, blah, blah, blah. But, but um, what it means to understand, when, when something interesting is happening is precisely when you understand the object well enough that you can see it from both points of view. So really understanding a class of polytopes means that you understand it from the vertex definition and from the facet definition. And typically, in physics, we're handed it in one way or the other. And, um, and if you're handed it, let's say, as a vertex definition, then it's not that easy. I mean, there's an algorithmic way of doing it, but, uh, but it's exponentially complicated. Okay? So, so the kind of hammer for doing it for a random polytope, you can apply to the ones that we get in physics, but it's somehow un it's not especially insightful. Um, What's really interesting is that the objects we see in physics, we can understand from both points of view. So you, you, so you really can really understand it, which means you understand the facet definition, you understand the vertex definition, you really get it. And very often, the kind of all the juice, all the sort of magic that is happening is exactly that while for a random polytope, you wouldn't know what to do, for the things we get in physics, we happen to be able to understand it from every point of view, and then you have a, you have a you know, analytic control of what it looks like on the other end. Okay? So that's a very good question, uh, but I don't have time to answer it uh, here, but uh, it has a very nice answer. That, um, okay. All right, now why does it work in, uh, why does it work in general? Um, well, what I want to do is, it's clear we're getting a polytope. What I now want to do is show you that we're getting a polytope that's guaranteed to have the property that if you go to a facet, what you get on the facet is a direct product of two lower polytopes of the same type. So the fact that it's polytopal is going to be, is obvious, is built in, but its factorization will also be obvious. We're gonna see that factorization is the obvious. Okay. And anyway, and that's what, uh, so you could just plot this on the computer with Mathematica for n equals six, and you'd get a very, very nice uh, three-dimensional shape that if you look has six uh, pentagonal faces, three square faces, and has exactly the combinatorics of the isosahedron, but although it won't look like the one I drew. It, it has very funny parallel sides, you know, it has a very special, specific version. Now, the shape that I drew is just a sort of combinatorics of how they uh, come together. It's a very specific version that you get, but you can just do it in, 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 in real time as I'm blabbering, just to get a feeling for what they look like. Yes? Sorry, was, was the statement that um, we're getting a polytope that has an n facet Product of n minus one facets? Uh, it, no, it has a, a, a co-dimension one facet, um, and every co-dimension one facet will be the product of, uh, uh, of two lower uh, associedra with two, two different values, n1 and n2, so long as n1 plus n2 add up to uh, n plus 2. Okay? All right, but um, uh, let me just give you a, uh, let me give you at least a sketch for why it's true. It's a really simple argument. So with the sketch, you should be able to, uh, to fill it in pretty easily. So um, just so I don't keep drawing uh, uh, lines all the time, again, imagine this is a, sort of a continuum picture, but you can fill in any number of lines, 45 degree lines in here that you like. Now here's the point. So let's say as I'm moving around here, I'm changing the x's here. The c's are fixed somewhere in here, right? The c's are all fixed. But as I move around, somewhere I'm hitting a boundary. That means that somewhere in here, there's some x which has gone to zero, right? So let's say there's an x in here which has gone to zero. Now, here's the uh, critical point. If an x has gone to zero, and this is related to a question that was asked uh, a moment ago, let's say there's an x here which is equal to zero. Now let's look at any causal diamond, either to the past or the future of this guy, it doesn't matter. But let's look at any guy which is 
a complementary t okay? If this x goes to zero, then those guys cannot go to zero. Now, why? Let's look at the Gauss's law. The Gauss's law says that x plus x prime uh, minus x left minus x right is equal to c, right? Say for this guy. Well, let's say I put x equal to zero. Then I can't put x prime to zero because if I do, the sum of two negative things would equal something positive. Okay? So in this way, we see the first vivid fact about these uh, polytopes. Remember, and maybe I didn't emphasize it when we first drew them, but one of the things these polytopes do is there's this face that corresponds to some x, there's this one that corresponds to a different one. The most zeroth order thing is that if two chords cross, if two channels are incompatible, well, the faces shouldn't meet each other, right? So the zeroth order job of this polytope is to keep apart the facets that are incompatible with each other. Okay, well, we just did it. Okay. We see that, uh, that facets that are incompatible cannot possibly meet. All right? So that's progress, but we need to see more. We need to see what you can call the totalitarian principle. Gelman called the totalitarian principle, which is that everything that's not forbidden is compulsory. Okay? So we see that, uh, every, so, we, so the incompatible guys can't meet, but we have to see that everything that is compatible will meet, right? And in fact, we're going to see more. We're now going to see that, uh, that the resulting object is actually the direct product of two lower uh, sosahedra. But to begin with, let's go to this picture, and let's first draw the obvious 45-degree lines coming out of it. Just the light rays that would bounce off coming off this point. Oops, I don't know why I didn't draw them straight, but anyway. Um, let me draw them a little more straight. So in here is where we're zero. You see, Nowhere in there, none of those x's can go to zero. Right? Because every x in here is either the past or the future of some diamond that is associated with this guy. So that's already kind of interesting. Now, furthermore, uh, you can really easily convince yourself that everyone in this red region, everyone here, you can actually solve for them if you're just given the data of the rest of the boundary regions. Just by using Gauss's law, if you know, if you give me the sort of data on every there that's not in the red regions, I can reconstruct what the x's in the red region are from the knowledge of the other ones. So I really don't need the red regions for anything. What I mean is that Nothing in the red regions can ever go to zero, so they're never going to participate in any other boundary. And furthermore, if you just give me the data of the x's on the non-red regions, I can completely reconstruct what the x's are in the red regions from them. So I'm going to do something here. I'm just going to make a new picture where I'm just going to scrunch away the red regions. I'm going to scrunch away the red regions by taking this little triangle and just sliding it, just to scrunch that away, and uh, taking this and, and scrunching it away there. I'll say what I mean by the scrunching in a second, but uh, let's just see uh, what happens if I do. See, I get this triangle here, and then I get this triangle here, OK? And uh, let me denote by these sort of red lines that I did some scrunching. Okay, so inside that red region is actually the scrunched of everyone that was uh, that was scrunched away. 
Okay, so it's just a reminder that that's where I scratched. Okay. Okay. Now we're done. All, all we have to do is make one final comment is uh, when I scrunch these guys away, as far as the rest of the problem goes, now let's say I have a Gauss's law here on two points that are sort of uh, separated by the scrunch line, right? Well, they just satisfy that x plus x minus x minus x is the sum of whatever meshes they had before plus the sum of all the red meshes that I scrunched away there. Okay, so that just redefines what I mean by the meshes for the new problem. And it's still positive, because everything was positive and I added positive things to positive things. Now why is that the case? Well again, it's clear here. Because again, if I take any diamond in here, uh, then, uh, then uh, whatever I have for this plus this, it's the sum of the meshes plus whatever the red stuff was. Meanwhile, if I give you the x's here and here and here, now I have a new problem. I have a new problem in terms of all of these x's and all of these x's and these new mesh constants that have been slightly modified by the scrunching. Okay, but now what do I have? Well, I have one associate and I have another associate. <laughs> The space of x's that I have is literally the direct product of the space of x's on this side and the space of x's on that side. Okay? So factorization is this utter triviality uh, about scrunching. Okay? A, that you can get rid of everyone on the inside from, um, uh, uh, because you can't set them to zero, and then you can, you can reconstruct all of them from the boundary values of the other ones, and when you scrunch it away, you just manifestly get the direct product of two smaller problems. All right, so that is an example of the kind of thing that we were, um, uh, uh, that we're talking about. As I said, it's still, you can still complain about a lot of things. Why do you do this wave equation? Why do you do all this stuff? But I think um, you'd have to sort of be a little pretty hard-hearted not to think that something sort of interesting has happened, right? We go to kinematic space, we ask these very simple questions, and then something comes out that has these features of there's a pole, and when you go on the pole, you factorize into the product of two other objects of exactly the same sort. And we did not ask anywhere about Feynman diagrams, propagators, nothing like that, okay? Now, I'll just say it in words, because I want to move on to the next uh, topic. Um, what is the amplitude? The amplitude is a canonical form um, uh, with logarithmic singularities on the boundary of the amplitohedron. But in fact, it's a little bit more uh, interesting than that. It's a form that's defined on the entire kinematic space. Okay? So let me, let me at least give one example of this. Um, so, so, because in the end, the kinematic space picture of the amplitohedron does, is of exactly the same uh, structure as what we're gonna see here, except somewhat more abstract. So already it's useful talking about it here. So, uh, so maybe the sort of final topic I'll just talk about, I'll really sketch in five minutes, is scattering forms and scattering amplitudes, functions and forms. So let's go back, forget about all this fancy schmancy stuff. Um, for the n equals four, uh, the amplitude is like one over s plus one over t, or in our, this language would be one over x13 plus one over x24, okay? That's the actual amplitude. But what we're gonna do is instead, we're gonna look at a scattering form, a one form. I mean, we have these poles, one over x13, one over x24. We're gonna look at a one form, obviously, uh, that lives on x13, x14 space. X, uh, sorry, this is x14. Sorry, uh, x, what am I doing? x24, sorry, okay? So omega is going to be dx13 over x13, and then plus or minus, let's uh, come back to that in a second, dx24 over x24.
Now, clearly, this is kind of closely related to that, except for this interesting question about the sign. All right? And in fact, what we're going to want here is the minus sign again. But what this form is, is there's a unique form on x13 and x24 space. So it's defined on this full <coughs> two-dimensional space, x13 and x and x24. But let's say you take this form and you pull it back. It's a one form that's defined on a two-dimensional space. So that means it's natural to take this form and just look at what, pull it back, look at what it looks like on a one-dimensional subspace. So I'm going to take this form, I'm going to pull it back onto the subspace where x13 plus x24 equals c. So what is this? Well, this is, for example, is dx13, <clears throat> and it's 1 over x13. And because of this minus sign, but also x24 is equal to c minus x13, this is actually plus 1 over c minus x13. You see, which is dx13 times 1 over x13 plus 1 over x24, where x24 is evaluated on this subspace. So see, something slightly interesting happened. There is this form that lives on the whole space, but its form is completely determined, what the minus sign even, is completely determined by the requirement that when you pull it back on this subspace, exactly the subspace that we talked about, you get the canonical form for the interval. And furthermore, the form on that subspace is the amplitude, gives you the amplitude. You strip off the, the trivial dx part, and the form gives you the uh, amplitude. Okay, so that's pretty cool. You start with a form that lives in the entire kinematic space. You pull it back to the subspace defined by the solution of the wave equation. So what is, the, what is the picture? So the picture, finally, for what's determining the amplitude, is in kinematic space, we have, oh, we have a nice piece of chalk here that I didn't see the whole time. Okay, so here's kinematic space. Here it's a space of all xij's. It's uh, n, n minus 3 over 2 dimensional. In this space is like a positive region. So I'm going to call this positive region P. So let me draw. I mean, it's not curvy. In this case, it's literally an, an orthant. But I'm just going to draw it just a little impressionistically. There's a positive region P. This is, in this case, just the region where all the x's are positive. But there's also this sort of hyperplane that lives in this space. And this hyperplane is defined by the wave equation, x plus x minus x minus x equals c. Okay? The definition of the hyperplane also has some positivity in it. right? The c's have got to be positive. All right? And the intersection between these two things gives us the isosahedron. Right? So that's the kind of picture that we've been seeing. And there's a big form that lives in the whole space. There's a big scattering form that lives on the whole space, such that when you pull it back to this uh, 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 subspace H, you get you know, dn minus 3x, some trivial form, multiplied by the amplitude. So this, in the end, is the story, right? This is what determines the amplitudes directly in, uh, in kinematic space, right? So it looks a little bit funny, a little bit, uh, why do we choose that type of plane? Why do we make various choices? But this is an example of the, of the kind of question. All right, there's going to be a literal analog of this for the amplitohedron. But uh, maybe we can stop now and uh, see if there's any questions about this and ask Yara about advice about what we're doing. But, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you for the second part.
so I have a maybe two part question. I'm here, Nima. Yeah. Um, it's obvious to me that you get these linear equations or inequalities that cuts out something in a positive orthand. But why is it compact and why is it not an unbounded object? Um, that's because there's, uh, it's clear there's always minus signs. Uh, so let me. Um, <laughs> Did you swallow it? I'm sufficiently sick to pride that I might erase the blackboard of the pizza. <laughs> You, you remove the microphone. Yeah. Oh, shit. Nice. Well, I went from being Madonna to, I don't know, Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you see, um, there's always, so I have one three, one four, one five, let's say. Um, but there's always, for one three, there's always is partner on the deep future boundary, okay? And so there's always a Gauss's law that involves just two, two terms. This plus this minus zero minus zero is positive. And so that means that that, that guy's positivity forces each one of these guys to be bounded. Okay. And Continuing on this structure here, you proved the factorization, but why is it an associahedra and not just the generalized permutahedra? Oh, because we got exactly the same right triangle picture back. Okay. But, but, so, so I'm saying that, that you get something which looks like these little right, right, right triangles, and, um, and when you go to a boundary, on that boundary you get the direct product of two other little right triangles of exactly the same, the same type. And you can have some fun doing it for the case where you make a choice from the initial, uh, from the initial strip. Instead of making the sort of simplest choice, just make a random choice. You can make any old choice that, that you want for, for, a whole, for keeping one copy of all the, of all the uh, variables. And it's exactly the same picture is uh, true. And, uh, and you can do the same scrunching argument. It's just slightly more fun to see how the scrunching works. But it's always the case that you get uh, objects of the same, same type. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, so, uh, how much of this, uh, I mean, what would ruin it? Uh, like, suppose I take scalar interactions which are, which have derivatives in it or which are mixed ah, or right. which are higher yeah. order. So, uh, yeah, so, so um, everything so far here is about denominators. Mm -hmm. Everything is about denominators and the structure of poles. And, um, but the and fact so that I get amplitudes as residues of the uh, form, uh, uh, there would, wouldn't the numerator also come? In the Very much so. No, so what I'm saying, everything, so th this, this entire structure is really about the uh, denominators. Um, okay. And uh, if you want to talk about a totally general theory, um, you want to somehow start thinking about uh, numerators in some way. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that I think what one of the biggest challenges, and you know, it's been happening in various ways, and there's lots of nice work. Uh, but, uh, but one of the things that, that needs to be done more systematically in this vein is to, is to remove the sort of vice grip of the d log form <laughs> from our imaginations. That, uh, that it could be there's a sort of a more a general way of endowing forms and functions with these uh, geometries. What seems definitely correct is that the, uh, the I mean, the reason it's a good start is that the, the singularity structure of, of, the, of the denominators is universal for any theory, or any color theory anyway. Um, uh, so, yeah. Uh, another very big challenge in this neighborhood, though, is uh, thinking about, is there a kind of a geometry for gravity? And if there's a kind of, and again, it doesn't have so much to do with gravity, it has to do with whether it's uh, things that are uncolored. And you're the zeroth order things to start with the dumbest theory of an uncolored phi cubed, where the four point amplitude would be one over s plus one over t plus one over u. There's no ordering. And there's your challenge. Because whatever the heck it is, if there's some kind of geometry, it would have to be one dimensional. 
because we only have one propagator. And yet it has three poles. There is no geometry that lives in one dimension that has three boundaries. Okay? So there's this very super basic problem. And this problem is reflected in many, many places. It's reflected in string theory. It's reflected, I mean, it's not a problem. It's a fact that somehow the sort of boundary structure of the moduli space for closed strings does not have boundaries in co-dimension one. It has boundaries in co-dimension two. Um, it's the open strings that you have these nice sort of uh, drop one in, in, uh, in uh, dimension phenomenon. So there is something new that's needed to uh, tie uh, uncolored theories uh, in this. Uh, yeah. Maybe there's nothing like it for uncolored theories. We don't know. But, uh, but uh, I think if you ask Yara, uh, he knows more about what gravity amplitudes look like, you know, in, in, in his little, in his bones somewhere than, certainly than I do, probably more than most people do. And he's pretty convinced that some structure like this exists. So I, I, I trust, trust him. Um, yeah. Okay. More questions? There is one more. Hi, do you know that picture you drew for the factorization, I understood that the red regions, everything's non-zero, but I, why did you get rid of them? Why did you scrunch it down? Oh, the only reason, I, I scrunched them visually, just so we could, I, I didn't need to, to uh, scrunch it, but then mm -hmm. um, uh, the, 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 the really important point is that everything inside, not only can they never go to zero, but they're completely determined by the things outside, just oh, from okay. Gauss's law. So I, I really, they're fully determined. They're fully, totally determined from, from, from the ones outside. Oh, thanks. Okay, more questions? If not, thanks Nima for this part of the lecture again. <laughs> and uh, now uh, we decided to do following. So we officially end the school yeah. now. <laughs> so thanks everybody for coming and thanks for all the speakers. Thank you. Probably we but can ask to stand up uh, people helping us and thank them. So it's Michal, it's uh, Petr, it's Taro, it's Christo. Uh, Christoph. <laughs> Who did I forgot? Of, of course, there are people helping us and they are not here. And uh, yeah, but uh, uh, like uh, people from uh, Seiko and people from our department, but they are not here, so. Okay, good. So, uh, but this means that we take a break now. There are some snacks in the back. And uh, people who need sleep or are on a regular schedule, <laughs> lame, lame people, then they can slowly leave. Uh, and, uh, but everybody else uh, who wants to uh, learn something about the amplitude hedron, so we reconvene back in, let's say, 20 minutes. And uh, Nima will continue. Okay. Ah, okay. You're away. <laughs> this is your plan. Sorry, I was looking at something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so so you have one three times. But she has to like manually search for that because there is no search for that. Well, but I was, I was, I was, but she sent it like half past one now. It was half past one in the morning, so I guess she was. He was trying to sleep with me. <laughs> Did a bit of a sleep.
Uh, and this is actually the kind of first thing Introduce this uh, uh, possible solution to the, to the string theory. And even if you don't really care about uh, strings, um, it is a true fact that the CHY people like to uh, uh, talk about as well that if you look at um, uh, if you look at uh, the cat's meal, 
But it is cool that everything about the Saturn equation is just continuous. Well, it's just because it connects the dot dx and the base of the Like that. Okay, good. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, so, but, so, uh, so, yeah. So, uh, in order to show that the action is positive, um, we want to show that for uh, that for any uh, for any for the action interval of the x dot the x bar two bars away from that x okay um, and crucially if the momenta are real for any figure here but if uh, so long as the momenta are real this is integral of the x dot So this is the cool thing about Lorentzian fitting theory, is that if you have a vector in Lorentzian figure theory such that d dot d equals to zero, then d dot d star is always positive. And uh, so this is just, if you write it a plus id, so a dot dot a plus id, this tells you that a squared minus d squared equals to zero, and that a dot d equals to zero. But if this is, uh, but let's say that A is, uh, uh, um, uh, oh, meanwhile, sorry, meanwhile, D dot D star is equal to A squared, D dot A plus D squared. Um, and uh, you see, uh, these uh, equations tell you that A has to be space like, right? Um, because, if, uh, because if A dot D is zero, like let's say A looks like one something, a, then D, in this equation, has to be zero something. Uh, right. Let's say A is one zero. Then D would have to be zero something. And then you can have A squared equals to D squared. So A has to be space like. Um, uh, and, but because A squared equals D squared, we know that A squared has a fixed sign, and so D dot D star is A squared plus D squared has a fixed sign. And, and this is only true in Lorentzian figure theory. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, because in any other figure theory, now we have extra components up there, and now it's not true. So that's what's actually special about the, uh, and, and so, uh, so that's why on any solution of the, of the scattering equation, not only is the action positive, but it's the Lagrangian density, the real heat density is uh, positive. So things that are more positive than it needs to be. Yeah, I think and, um, about yeah. it, being, uh, damped it is, yeah, and it's damped elsewhere because it's possible for the whole action to be positive while the Lagrangian density actually goes negative somewhere yeah. in the middle. So, so the Lorentzian figure theory is hemorrhaging yeah. because the integral something everywhere are positive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, but anyway, I always wonder what the, the, you know, this, this is a this is an amusing fact about the uh, Lorentzian figure theory that I didn't know. <laughs> Uh, about, yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, well, yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Yes, yes. Thanks for staying. Thanks. I appreciate it.